everybody. Today, AAT Extension delight to launch the webinar on tracking and measuring progress of foreign aid development project. Uh, practical aspect for the project management, m and uh, Today, uh, this webinar also broadcast in our Facebook Live, AAT Extension Facebook Live too. So today we have uh, three keynote speaker to share their experience on M and E projects. Uh, we have Dr. Thanatat Putasuwan, Dr. Sylvia Siswo, and Mr. Warawe Cholasin. With he will serve as a speaker and the moderator in this session as well. So each uh, speaker will present uh, their session on twenty minutes. After that finish, the Q and A session will be start. And then the audience uh, who has any inquiry or question, you can type the questions in Q and A's box. Our speaker will answer for those questions. So now I would like to ask our executive director, Dr. Donatan Chor, for the greeting message for the audience. Okay. So very good afternoon to everybody, and a, a very warm welcome to this latest uh, seminar by AIT. This one on tracking and measuring progress of foreign aided development projects. Um, I think this is, a, this is a topic that's very close to AIT's heart. Uh, AIT itself, of course, started as a development project and um, has survived for the past 60 years, largely on, on, um, on other foreign development projects. So it's very much in our, in our lifeblood. And I think one of the changes that we've seen over the past 60 years is that the nature of development projects has become progressively more complex. Um, if you, few of us were around in the, in the late 50s or early 60s, but uh, one thing we know is that development projects tended to focus more on infrastructure and, uh, and um, things that were easier to measure. If we look at development projects today, Typically, they focus on, um, yeah. me uh, on, on metrics that are far more uh, difficult and complex to, uh, to measure. So actually determining the success of a project is, is that much harder than it was. And uh, the, more we, the more we learn about how societies develop, how, um, how we affect change in this world, the harder it is, in a sense, to, um, to, to track and monitor progress. Uh, and also, by its definition, the importance of, of these particular aspects of project management are, are progressively more important. So in this particular um, webinar, we're focused on uh, the practicalities rather than the theories of, of um, monitoring and evaluation. And we're delighted to have with us uh, a number of speakers um, who bring diverse perspectives on the practicalities of monitoring and evaluation development projects. So um, a very warm welcome to all of you. I'll leave it to my colleague, uh, Mr. Warabet Chonison, to introduce the, the speakers. And um, I wish everybody a very productive and enjoyable afternoon with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jonathan Cho uh, from AIT Extensions, and I welcome all the audience again to this uh, webinar uh, talk. And as you know, that today uh, is the topics uh, is very important that uh, Dr. Jonathan has mentioned, and actually this. Uh, this topic is one of the regular uh, topics that AIT Extension has offered as a regular training process. At least we offer every year the same course. We also uh, customize this course into other organization and also the projects that we, uh, we are doing with donor agencies. So uh, we, we do believe that this topic will be very, very important for for the projects and for evaluators, uh, researchers, and academicians. Uh, and uh, before that, uh, before we uh, start developing this uh, webinar program, uh, we use the similar topics as the uh, project monitoring and evaluations. And after that, we 
made it more attractive by uh, putting in a way that you know uh, we need to also monitor or tracking the progress of the projects and also how we are going to uh, make sure or report the progress of the projects in a, a very more practical manner, especially during the uh, COVID-19, during a very difficult time that we have had. So as you uh, see in the in the leaflet, in the brochure, we have uh, three speakers today. One speaker is live from Korea, uh, which is uh, Dr. Sylvia Sabo. And also another speaker is Dr. Tanatat. He is also live from AIT and also myself he is also you know, um, uh, giving you information, make a presentation from AIT. So the first speaker that we would like to start uh, today is uh, talking about the, the uh, project monitoring and evaluation from the perspective of the donor agencies. What is the current situation? What is the current practice and requirement of the donor agency in relation to the uh, project monitoring and evaluation? So I would like to introduce Dr. Tanatat Puttaswan the next speaker who uh, used to be the uh, former program managers on private sector financial uh, service of the World Bank. He used to use, he used to work with the World Bank in Washington DC and also working with the World Bank projects in Bangkok, uh, look after the uh, program in Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam and Myanmar, including Thailand. So I believe that uh, Dr. Tanatat presentations and talk will be uh, giving you a very uh, insight uh, uh, information to all of you. So may I now request Dr. Tanatap to start presentation, please. Well, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you uh, for, for that kind introduction and uh, welcome all the participants uh, to this webinar session. Um, I like to, to begin by saying that I will introduce the, the concept of international projects who are, uh, that are being implemented, funded by international agencies, and not just the World Bank. We're talking about ADB, we're talking about AusAid, U, um, uh, Eurozone, or even JBEG or JICA. So the presentation itself, uh, and what I'm going to try and do to deliver, uh, applies across the board. And one thing I like to, um, to caution myself as well is that we call them internationally funded projects. Oftentimes we call them donors, but really it's a partnership. It's a partnership between these countries, our countries and these agencies. So I'm gonna be using that term interchangeably, partners and donors. So um, if, if uh, you all don't mind, uh, we're gonna be operating as such. I have 20 minutes. Um, I prepare some slides, um, I'll share those with you. Project monitoring and evaluation, international partners or donors expectations. I think from what Dr. Shaw was saying, we're not talking about theories here. We're talking about practical, how to do it. So all of us can use um, the practical experience. Our context today will be about project cycle, project management and project monitoring and evaluation. I like to talk about what donor expect and also how to incorporate theory of change, because that, that is the most important methods and tools that you can use in order to achieve monitoring and evaluation results. And finally, I'll, I'll provide some checklists for, for you to take home and, and try to practice, okay? All of this, it comes out to effective monitoring evaluation assessment and also impact assessment and measurements of outputs and outcome, which is what you're trying to achieve. And then you go back to the project itself. The project cycle, most of you know this, on the left side is the overall project cycle. You have the design, you have development, you have the analytical part of it and implementation, and then you evaluate. On the right side, it's a little bit more in detail. Project planning, after you initiate what the project should, should be. And then you implement, execute, you monitor, and then you make adjustments, and you come back and review your development objectives. It's a cycle. And that's where we, we come up, either a weakness 
or not efficient and effective mo project monitoring itself. I have this slide to show you. Projects are, are basically an intervention, an intervention on whether you solve a problem, improve a situation, or increase capacity, or increase efficiency. Think of it, on the right side, I show you some infrastructure projects. You, you build roads in order to provide access to the poor, in, or in order to provide access to rural areas or highways. Energy, you generate electricity for better lives and also attract businesses. Now we're moving into solar energy and alternative energy. Why? To reduce cost. Why? To improve climate. These are all reasons behind projects. Education, you build schools in some of our countries to provide education to the children. You improve curriculum. You have teachers training. So projects are there in order to improve something. So you have a starting point and an end point. And that's where it comes in. You align project development objectives. Most of you, if you have been involved in international partner projects, you know that you have to initiate and make it explicit what the development objectives are. By doing this, you will solve this problem and hopefully the results will come. That's all in the development objectives. And then you have to align that with the country strategy, the so-called five-year plans for Thailand, Laos, Myanmar. Everybody has this so-called five-year plan, the National Economic and Social Development Plan. So you align your project to the national objectives. And then you start talking to international partners. The World Bank has its own strategy. ADB does too. AusAid does. DFID does. GTZ does. What donors are doing is don't don't be don't be naive in saying you can you can talk to one donor without talking to another. Donors know what you're doing. They have a pool resources, limited resources, so they talk. GTZ may choose to support SMEs. The World Bank may support health. ADB supports uh, education. It's all different, but they know what each one is doing. So you have to align your project development to donors or partners' strategy. How do you do that? Every international donors have what they call country partnership framework. Some call it country partnership strategy, some call it country partnership framework. Some call it country operation management plan, depending on what they're called. The people who are responsible will have to align project development to the country objective. That involves a lot of assumptions, a lot of changes in projects, a lot of activities. And how do you know changes take place? And that's when you, you bring in theory of change. You bring in theory of change, make assumptions that this is the problem. This is where you start. This is where your square one is. You start from there. Your project is the intervention activities. And hopefully certain results will come out of that. That's the whole value change. And I believe um, Dr. Sylvia and, and, and Kun Borovet will talk more in detail. Okay? To operationalize projects, you see this is more detail from one to two to three to four. Identification, planning, execution, review and evaluation, make changes, it's all in the cycle. What you do is you incorporate theory of change into it. That's what donor wants to see. Is there money being spent with results? The so-called bang for the buck. Is the 200 million loans or grant that are spent on certain projects are being achieved. Achieve what? Development objectives, country or national strategies. Some suggested checklists. Your project might start with a pre-assessment, the needs assessment, or the feasibility studies. What you learn from there, you incorporate that into the development objectives of a country. 
the five five year plan, it's sector plan. Each country has a sector plan, health, education, finance, transport, communications, you name it. And you incorporate those into priorities. Then you will be able to design the projects of act activities, the intervention itself, and the outputs. And if it's a long-term project, you probably design it by period, one year, two year, three year down the road. Once the project started happening, then you start measuring it, but you walk backwards. That's what I'm trying to, to convey here. You start with, with needs assessment, you have project development objectives, and you walk backwards. What it needs to set up in terms of output, who are the beneficiaries, who will benefit from it? That's the direct. What about indirect? Stakeholders, civil society, government, private sector involvement. Certain projects are PPP, public-private partnership. Who will benefit? Who bears the cost? All these are assumptions. And your monitoring and evaluation will need to address all these issues. Not to mention procurement, financial management, and safeguards. Right now, even in the service sector project, you have environmental safeguards. So you have to be broadly covering project development. And what's more important is the assumptions of the changes. The assumption of the theory of change will be, to me, is the most important. And you work closely with donors or partners if you are developing an ADB or World Bank or JICA project, there'll be a counterpart for you to work with. And the counterpart can help guide you because there are fiduciary duties by law that they have to follow and you have to follow with your country's guideline. So in developing monitoring and evaluation, I urge you to, to work closely with World Bank, ADB, JICA's counterpart and by law, your own Ministry of Finance. Your own Ministry of Finance will have to assess your project, how it was implemented, and most importantly, how the money was spent. So you have to work on that front. The theory of change can incorporate the administrative changes to your project, the capacity that you have built, the, the the changes with the transparency, the effectiveness, the efficiency of your project, those are all accounted in the, in the theory of change, monitoring and evaluation. So what donors really expect is a broad view of how projects were implemented and what changes took place and how you would quantify those changes. Number of beneficiaries, how much money was saved, the outputs and the outcome. And it's easier said than done. Let me, let me uh, finish there by saying it's easier said than done because when, once you start implementing a project, there are requirements. Inception report, annual report. I provide these slides for you as a checklist. Midterm report, which is a big team report and then closure report. In some cases, you will have an impact assessment after closure. So what you see is that monitoring and evaluation is a spectrum. It's a spectrum of activities that each project is not the same. But in principle, you can design your, your monitoring and evaluation with theory of change, with other tools, focus group, interviews, database, in order to achieve what you set out as your monitoring and evaluation goals, okay? But, but before, before you start worrying about how you should do it, you have time to prepare in the project proposal. That's, that's where you outline what your M&E system will look like. And you will have the, the help of the partners, the help of your own countries. Ministry of Finance and other stakeholders in your country 
to help formulate that M&E system. Last but not least, the database. It's very important. Not just administrative and financial database, but you will need a database that cover substantive changes. If it's a road project, if it's an education project, if it's a health project, it's all different. So you have to design with certain type of professional expertise what the output will look like and what you will monitor. There is no checklist for that. It's, it's an art and it's a, it's a professional judgment as you move along. So I think I, I like to end there. The important of it is database and the assumptions of what you will try to monitor and evaluate. So with that, let me let me stop there, and then uh, I can come back to you when we have the questions and answers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tanatat, uh, for for your presentations and uh, very important uh, points of the information that giving as uh, a key areas that we have to do uh, when we are going to do the project uh, monitoring and evaluations. I I I, I can give you a couple of. Uh, a more points that uh, I would like to remind the audience and colleagues doing this exercise. Uh, number one is that uh, always consider the, the country strategies and, and country master plans in various sector as part of your measurements or indicators or something that you have to consider in order to make alignment of the international interventions or aided projects uh, to the need of the countries. And, and obviously that will bring the project, which is the external intervention, will have the pathway to go to create impact to the beneficiaries. Uh, whether or not uh, you consider the country strategies or national strategies uh, before the project decides or during the project evaluation, I believe that the clients or the, uh, the counterpart will ask you as the evaluator to make sense of your evaluation in terms of the mapping of the results to the requirements of the countries that you are working on. So this is very important that we have to consider, you know, both at the national level and also as the international inter intervention level. Uh, a second one is uh, the terms that Dr. Tanata had used is on assessment. So if one could notice that actually evaluating the current situation in order to formulate projects or project identification in different sectors is also very important. So it means that if we are going to see whether the, the project is, is possible to be setting as the intervention, maybe we also have to study and see whether the situation, the importance, or it is the problems uh, can be, you know, evaluated in a way so that we can uh, formulate the projects that maybe uh, meet to the requirement of countries and also meet to the needs of the beneficiary or not. So uh, keep in mind that along the line, uh, we have to look at the assessment all the time in order to see and also make sense of the projects at the same time uh, comparing the situation that we are going to uh, compare between the uh, project interventions and also this existing situation. Uh, last but not the least, I, I believe that uh, reporting, reporting and reporting is very important in every layers of the project cycle, in every cycle steps that we are making, we need to make sure that Every information, every, every analytics has to be uh, given to the client organization, to the counterparts, and also to the international partners. And the only uh, reports that we have different uh, places is very important means of the communication that will be reaching to the uh, donor agency and also stakeholders. So reporting is also one uh, component that we cannot you know, ignore in the project evaluations, uh, keep in mind that. And Dr. Tanatat also mentioned many times about the fear of change. Now we are coming to uh, discuss uh, about uh, what is the reason behind that the donor agencies and countries has to map the theory of change. Uh, 
uh, what behind that and, and how we are going to map the three options that make sense to the project design and also project uh, monitoring evaluation. So in this uh, particular issues, I would like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Sylvia Sabo. Uh, she is the faculty member of AIT School of Environmental and Resource and Development of AIT uh, to present to you and give you idea uh, the concept behind theory of change and also the frame of uh, project monitoring and evaluation. So Dr. Sylvia, please. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Varavaten. Thank you very much for the invitation to this uh, seminar. I'm delighted to be speaking here together with the other excellent panelists. Uh, let me just add a few ideas to what Dr. Tanatat already mentioned. I'll just try to share my screen now. And I'll start with just general introduction to m &E, so please bear with me if that's too easy and very basic. I'll skip through this quickly, then I'll focus on the theory of change, and then just share a few ideas about uh, m &E in times of the COVID pandemics, so uh, what we are facing now. So let me just start with the overview of m &E systems, right, m &E framework. Uh, here is just a logical diagram. And basically, what is the goal of m &E? Obviously, by definition, it helps us monitor projects and it helps us make the assessment, what uh, my colleagues already mentioned previously. So it's very, very critical part of any, any project. And it, it has to be obviously thought of very carefully at, uh, at the design, at the project design stage. So very, very early on. And as my colleague already mentioned, we have to focus very much on all kinds of assumptions and thinking about different kinds of risks which the project may encounter in the future. So one big risk, for example, now, which no one could foresee is COVID, right? But there are other risks which we can foresee uh, with less or more difficulty, such as, for example, um, elections, forthcoming elections, changes um, in power, um, I don't know, natural hazards, any kind of changes which pose risk to the project. That's quite critical. And it's also one element of um, project management and m &E system, which is the risk register. So starting with risk and assumptions, and then coming with the inputs, right? So all kinds of uh, financial inputs, which is money and human resources, and then following up with activities, those activities should lead to some kind of outputs, obviously, be it research outputs or be tangible outputs in development projects on the ground. And they should then lead to outcomes. Outcomes is already some kind of a bigger change. So for example, change in knowledge, change in awareness, change in attitudes of our beneficiaries, that would be a tangible outcome. And then ideally, and that's actually a requirement in development projects, it should lead to some kind of a bigger scale impact, right? Either social, economic, or environmental impact. So I'll give an example of that um, in a second. So that is just an overview, quick overview of the m &E framework. And uh, our famous log frame, I will not uh, dwell into this, but it's also a key document of any m &E system where we actually can track in a very, very nitty gritty way and uh, the progress of the project. So we look at the activities, we looked at the outputs, we look at the uh, outcomes. And for all of those, we should, we should have some kind of indicators, some very tangible indicators, which will then allow us to measure the progress. And if you just Google anywhere, if you are not yet familiar with this, if you are just going to Google log frame, okay, or log frame framework or log frame uh, Excel spreadsheet, you will see hundreds of different uh, log frames popping up. So it's a very, very critical document for any m &E system. But I was specifically asked to focus on the theory of change. So let me go into this and let me just summarize once again about the m &E system and the key elements. So we have the risk register, when we have the risk, any kind of risks and assumptions, which is one kind of key document. Then we have our log frame. Then we have our theory of change. Those are the three critical documents for any m and &E system. 
And then we can have also some other uh, documents, such as, for example, learning strategy. So nowadays, also, we don't only talk about monitoring and evaluation, but we also include learning strategy. So that can also become part of the MNE system. And finally, something which is called pathways to impact, which is very much aligned with the theory of change, okay, but which is something a little bit more detailed than the theory of change, and which really allows us to see how the change is being um, achieved in terms of um, uh, have a project achieving an, an impact. So having taken stock of that, of those key elements of the monitoring and evaluation system, what is a theory of change? Why do we need a theory of change? And my colleague already mentioned it's quite critical in any project because the theory of change by definition, and yes, development projects are very pragmatic, very operational, but theory of change by definition is something more hypothetical, right? And we do need that hypothetical, that theoretical framework, okay, to understand how actually all those pieces are connected. So it's basically a theoretical framework, a set of assumptions, or as we can see here on the slide, a logical sequence on how those hypothesized changes, what do we want to achieve, how they are likely to be achieved, right? So let me just uh, give an example here of a theory of change. Uh, that's a real theory of change from our development, um, research to development project. And I should also add that uh, MNE systems are used not only in purely development projects. So what I mean by this, not purely development projects which are operational on the ground, for example, through NGOs like Save the Children, Oxfam, or uh, international agencies like ADB or African Development Bank, but MNE sy systems are also used very widely in what we call research to development projects. So right now also we run some research to development projects and those are basically consortia of universities and other partners jointly working on change, right? Achieving change. So this uh, theoretical um, or theory of change is actually taken from one of the research to development projects um, which we are currently implementing, funded by the UK uh, Research Council which is called a trade hub, UK trade hub, which is a very, very large scale, uh, large scale consortium uh, project. And uh, this theory of change, as you can see, is coming um, from quite a long, quite a long actually process, which allowed us to achieve this still draft. Why I'm saying draft? Because a theory of change, even though it's designed at the project design stage, it is a document which still can be changed and updated as the project is already running because obviously the circumstances, the circumstances change, there are new factors coming in. So it's a live uh, kind of document which can uh, always be updated, obviously not changed completely, but it can also be slightly updated. And here, as we see, it follows that sequence also of MNE framework as well as the log frame starting with different activities. Here we have this at the bottom, different activities. Then it's a framework in this case, which goes bottom to up. So starting with activities, then different kinds of output. So for example, here, because it's a research to development project, we have a lot of research outputs, right? For example, different research papers, research output translated and synthesized into recommendations, right? But also some kind of more, um, Mm, generalized, not only research-based uh, outputs, for example, equitable partnerships are already being created. So different kind of outputs in those de um, development, uh, research to development projects, okay? Then going upwards, we see outcomes. And here we have what we call short-term outcomes and longer-term outcomes. So different kind of uh, outcomes, which uh, we, uh, we are planning to achieve in and uh, five plus years, which are really already, as we see a time tangible change. So for example, investment in commodity production is moving to sustainable outcomes. That is already our intended outcome. Local economic and social empowerment is enhanced. So all kinds of outcomes, and obviously those are synthesized. We just see a very brief headings 
But actually, behind each of those headings, there has been a lot of thinking. And theory of change, I should also highlight, is actually a process developing this theory of change, as well as other documents, many uh, documents, is a very kind of collaborative and uh, consensus-based uh, process where we actually spent many, many days and had several workshops coming up to an agreement, especially in big, big projects, on how this theory of change should look. So if we are looking again from uh, down, down towards um, upwards, then we see the final, the final stage is our intended impact, which is here at 10, uh, 10 plus years, right? What we are hoping or planning or aiming to achieve in 10 years and beyond, which is actually defined as trade systems benefit nature and people, right? And that again is a big heading, but obviously there has been a lot of thinking behind that. And we do have for each of those boxes certain indicators that have been put in place, which will actually allow us to measure this progress and which are also aligned with the project lock frame. So um, that's the theory of change. And again, if you try to Google theory of change development project or theory of change research to the development project, you will also see many, many documents. But I think the key point to remember is that really is some kind of a conceptual framework of what we are aiming to achieve and how we are aiming to achieve this, right? So from status quo now, what we are actually planning to see, what kind of change, what kind of impact we are aiming to see in the lifetime of the project, but also beyond the lifetime of the project. So that's the theory of change. And let me just scroll down uh, towards the next slide. Right, so developing a theory of change, what I already mentioned, those are some key questions which we should be asking ourselves. What are the objectives of the project, right? Very fundamental. It's like in research. What are your research questions, right? Otherwise, we don't know where we are going. We don't know what we are doing. We need to have objectives, right? What are our objectives? What outcomes we do aim to achieve through these projects? And how, right? What are the intermediate steps which are going to lead us to achieve those outcomes. And this is how the theory of change is also helping us visualizing actually those different outcomes. And then beyond uh, developing the theory of change, but very closely aligned with this, thinking how we are actually going to measure those output outcomes and impact. Because we have to think, obviously, um, in terms of alignment of all of those documents, right? If we only have a theory of change, which is some kind of a conceptual framework, but detached, not able for us to actually measure, then that theory of change is likely to be of limited use. We have to really think in alignment how we are actually going to operationalize this theory of change, how we can actually develop some indicators, some measurements, how we are going to actually be able to collect some data to be able to see those pathways in the theory of change and measure the progress. And obviously the best time, as I mentioned, to develop, to create a theory of change is during the program design phases. So it can't happen that we are running two years into the project and the donor is going to ask us, oh, could you, by the way, show us the theory of change? And then suddenly we are going to uh, you know, come up with, with one. That's obviously not possible. That is not how it's going to work. We have to very carefully think about the theory of change together with all other m &E documents at the design stage, the project or the program design stage, right? So that's um, very critical. Good indicators. I don't want to put too much time into this because that's quite basic also, but I think we all know that good indicators by definitions, they have to be Measurable, we need to be able to capture change. And why do we need indicators? Because in the projects, we do need to be able to capture change, monitor change in time. But ideally also, and in terms of alignment that my colleague was also, my colleagues were mentioning in terms of aligning with national priorities and national development plans, ideally we would want to have those indicators also aligned with some other key indicators. So for example, if we are having a development project which probably contributes also to SDGs, right? And the national development plans, 
then probably we would want to have some indicators which are also aligned with, let's say, SDG indicators, or which are aligned with indicators in the national development plans. Because then our project is not only going to be that small development project, right? But what donors also want to see is going to be part of the bigger development agenda and kind of a bigger development work. So it's very, very critical to also align those indicators with other um, existing indicators and development uh, agenda. And also thinking about some feasibility, right? Is it actually going to be feasible for us to collect the data for those indicators? Because we can have the best indicators in the world we can take the list of SDG indicators and we can see that actually it doesn't make sense or maybe it's even not possible to collect the data to measure those indicators. So we have to consider the visibility, right? So let me just pause a little bit here because I'm jumping a little bit from topic to topic. <laughs> let me just pause a little bit here. Uh, m and &E, very critical to align all kind of pieces, all kind of m and &E documents, right? And one key piece of the m and &E system is the theory of change. The theory of change allows us to have a conceptual framework showing how our project is going to be achieved and how we are going to make an impact in the life of the people, right? Or maybe in the environment, depending on what the sector is, yes? And that theory of change has to be very closely aligned with all other documents of the m and &E system, such as log frame, such as pathways to impact, such as also hopefully the learning strategy, which is going to be part of this uh, MEL system. And it has to be aligned very clearly also, as other colleagues mentioned, with the national development plans, but also other development agendas, right? So for example, the SDG agenda. Or if it's environment, then you know some other biodiversity agendas. So that's on the um, theory of change. And I wanted just to share some few thoughts to um, uh, conclude here on the m &E. How can actually we uh, now be productive in our m and &E work during the COVID, during the COVID pandemics, right? m and &E is a very dynamic, um, work, uh, we need to collect a lot of data. We typically need, we need to make, uh, we need to meet people to um, understand how the progress uh, is going, uh, whether we are actually achieving the progress which we have uh, been planning, where are we? So how can we effectively monitor? How can we effectively, effectively conduct evaluations during those critical times? And I'll just share some few thoughts here, and they are not groundbreaking, but uh, maybe they will uh, steer some further thinking amongst the colleagues. So obviously, in the m and &E world, as in any other work streams, the work doesn't stop, right? Like now also, we have a webinar, right? And we don't have an online meeting. We just have a webinar online. Similarly, with uh, development and research to development projects. There are many constraints. Of course, yes, we can't go and collect field data in many cases, but we can continue our work online, for example. And I can actually share that in one of the previous organizations when I worked, and I don't want to judge whether it was an effective approach or not, but actually a lot of m and &E work and a lot of um, midterm kind of evaluation work was also taking place online and on the phone. And in particular, that is the case when those are multi-country projects, right? When there are big multi-country projects in faraway locations, it is actually not even, you know, during the COVID, but in kind of normal times, it is also not possible and it's very costly to travel. So a lot of this work can actually take place online through meetings like this. A lot of work can be done in collaboration, obviously with colleagues who work directly in the projects in the country, right? Uh, through the project managers or researchers working directly in the countries who can help us actually, <coughs> apologies, who can actually help us collect the information which we need. And it may not need to be face to face. Sometimes we also, even in research now, in research thesis, we also collect data through online service. And in many cases, it's absolutely possible, right? So we need to 
optimize those online tools. And when internet is not working, we also there are also offline data collection platforms, right? So also we have to bear in mind what kind of platforms we are using. Because actually when we are collecting data, sometimes offline, <coughs> we, can all, we can also use some platforms um, which work offline. We need to maximize the secondary data also, the use of secondary data. There is a lot of data, secondary data. So we can use some of our baselines and then co compare them against the secondary data which is collected by other agencies. If that's the case, we are very lucky, right? So, um, so yes, and then uh, obviously in the m &E projects themselves, we also need to be able to capture to capture the additional impacts, which were uh, obviously unpredicted or uh, we did not anticipate them, the additional impacts of COVID. So for example, in our case, we work a lot in social sciences on the impacts of life, livelihoods, on impacts on food security, impacts on health, right? So obviously COVID is going to have some additional impacts on the life of the people. And we do need to be able to update our m and &E documents, be it theory of change or other documents, to be able to reflect those impacts because those impacts of COVID are also going to obviously contribute to our outcomes as well as probably our final intended uh, big impact. So that also has to be taken into consideration. I think I'll stop here. I've been speaking for a while. So if there are any questions at the end, I'll try to answer those. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sylvia, for, for your presentations and sharing ideas about the theory of change. Um, I, uh, I pick up some key points. I mean, um, it is very important to have this uh, theory of change uh, maps uh, that also helping the, not, not only the project evaluations or progress measurement, but also if you notice that in many cases for operationalizations or recommendations of any further activities that the project is recommending, because those are the relationship of the, of the main aspect of the projects that can bring change. So if we have a proper uh, mapping of the related chains of the aspect that we have to consider that also helping us to go back to the first design and also make sense of the oper operationalization plan when we are going to recommend the at the project management or implementation level. And of course, for the project evaluation itself, the theory of change frame uh, will remind you not to forget about the a macro level criteria, medium level criteria, and also the micro level criteria or measures or indicator that always you know put into the scope of the project. So it will be very easy and convenient for the project evaluator to refer back to that when you you know move on with the project's progress and you have to evaluate projects. So you can stop there and open to the page that you have the, this mapping. So it's helped you to remind that uh, which one is the priority that we have to set as the key indicator or criteria uh, for, for the evaluations. And also Dr. Uh, Sylvia also touched upon the, uh, the M&E documents that we also have to refer back and forth to this mapping or the, the chains of the outcomes, inputs and impact uh, so that when we are making uh, uh, reportings and maybe structuring reportings, maybe this also helping in terms of the uh, presentations of your result of the project evaluation as well. All right, so this is very important uh, ideas, although it's very, very theoretical, it's very conceptual, but we can also translate this into a very uh, practical way of making, you know, uh, project evaluations, uh, adding value to the, to the project clients. Uh, can I ask Dr. Tanatat uh, in terms of the uh, theory of change? Uh, since uh, now the audience uh, do not have uh, any question on that, so if uh, uh, what what is the what is the uh, World Bank uh, interest in having uh, or referring to the theory of change when when one has to do the reporting for the project progress? Is that how far that the banks or ADB would refer to that, and uh, do they like it, or uh, you know uh, how important it is? 
Okay, thank, thank you for that question. Um, in terms of, of designing the project itself, um, most institutions would not explicitly say what theory of change you are doing. It's basically built into the project document as intervention activities. And the intervention activities will outline the activities to be implemented, which is the intervention itself. Once you have a set of activities, you can relate to the assumption of what changes will happen because of that activity. For example, let's use a, a most visible, quantifiable example. Let's say you were going to build a road system from north to south. The development objective is to modernize the country, provide access to the market for rural areas, to provide transport channel, which will save time and cost. You can see that clearly. So the building of the road system itself is the intervention. And then you start making assumptions, how much time it will save, how much access people will get, how much income it will increase for the poor people. Will the transport cost be reduced? Will transport allow more businesses in rural areas? And so on and on and on. Without having to say that's the theory of change. But that's the assumption on your eventual outcome. So what I'm saying is it's a spectrum of project design where you build in to the activity what changes will happen, how you would measure it. And that's how you measure it become the basis for your database system, your data collection system, and your data evaluation system. So in that regard, international organizations have practiced theory of change for quite some time. What, what they are focusing on in the past, I would say, 10 years or so, is the impact of the changes, the eventual outcome, and then you extend that to the impact on the economy, the impact on poverty, the impact on better living conditions, the impact on environment, the impact on climate change, if you will, depending on what, what is the, the nature of the project. So in short, you can build into in the project the theory of change when you start designing, taking in consideration the activities and how you would measure the change. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tanatat. Um, yeah, and one, one more thing that, that reminds me when Dr. Sylvia uh, talked about that the, the theory of change map, the TOC map, can be changed uh, when the project has some uh, progress to a certain status. And that's actually uh, very useful because at the end of the day, it's, it's not a fixed map, but it's also uh, allow you to be able to adjust to the current situation and also status of, of the project activity within the scope of the project, which is identified uh, early on. So I think uh, the, the mappings, the, the, the mind mapping, the ideas or the concept of that, if we have in mind of the evaluators, project evaluators will be very, very useful. I remember that at one point when we were not able to identify the way that how to produce the outcome from the activities that we have had decided, uh, we were recommended by the consultants or the experts that why don't you uh, build in the new bridging objectives in order to make sure that whatever the outcome that we would like to have, now we have some uh, sub activities that can be add on and that bridging objective will become some additional activities that can lead into the outcome. So it is uh, very, uh, very useful and it is very uh, helpful for the uh, project evaluators to, to
to see the big picture. So we have one question here. Let me uh, go to the uh, questions. Uh, so the questions uh, uh, um, uh, coming from the audience is in case the third party monitoring does not does not report appropriately and correctly to the donor, how can it influence the implementers and how the people impacted can advocate in case they are? Uh, may I uh, request Dr. Tanadha to address this question? Very practical questions. Sure, thank you. Um, let me, let me um, assume that the question is regarding you have a third party monitoring and evaluation expert, that the project contract on the side. And the question is, how can you improve monitoring and evaluation reports based on the project? The third party may not be, be familiar with project developments, may not be familiar with your in-country social and economics and, and political con, uh, considerations. So you have to go back to the source. And to me, if I was the project team of a country, I would first focus on the terms of reference for that monitoring and evaluation system. You have to tie your terms of reference to the overall development objectives and activities. And then you have to look at your project. Is it required to be an annual m and &E? Eventually you have a midterm report. Eventually you have a closure report. So those periodic m and &E reports dictates what you need to know. And then you draft the terms of reference, agree to it with the consultants or the third party experts, even ask them to submit a template of m and &E reports before the work starts. They have to go in and incorporate theory of change of their own in order to report to you the, put it this way, they have to hit the bullseyes with their reporting. So the first thing you do is you control the terms of reference, make it sure, make it clear, make it precise on what they need to deliver. That's a short answer to it. Thank you very much. Right. So, uh, it, uh, so for these questions, uh, it is important to go back to the TOR, and the TOR will help the uh, the earlier uh, commitment of the works, and also that also helping to go into the um, uh, evaluations items and the process that has to be done, so that. Uh, uh, is reflect the realities that everybody uh, can accept that and uh, uh, the evaluation result is reflecting the real situation of the progress of the projects, all right. I, I will share some of the practical experience here uh, to, to the last of, uh, to the end of the sessions. And I believe that uh, this uh, experience from our uh, practical experience will uh, give you some lights on the uh, ideas that you have uh, behind the project monitoring and evaluations. So uh, this is the practical aspects of the things that uh, I would like to share from our uh, direct experience. The, the key considerations, I would say that uh, now it is the, the third party role, sorry for the uh, typing errors. Um, uh, this is, this is uh, the looking at the progress of the projects and also measurement of the measurements of the achievement of the projects uh, are from the eye of the outsider. And if it is, if it is, we have the situation where we have to have some common agreement, I think at the end of the day, all parties involved in the projects also has to be consulted and also, you know, uh, verify the data and also consult on the reportings of the project monitoring and evalu evaluations. I mean, uh, although we are the third party that assigned to evaluate the projects, we also have to consider or we also have to uh, review uh, the uh, project evaluation report that uh, everybody agree to the data and informations that reflecting the real situation. So this may be helping to resolve the problem that we have discussed 
uh, a while ago. All right. Um, uh, second one, evaluation is the fact-finding activity. So we need data, like Dr. Sylvia has said, uh, and also uh, we sometimes cannot depend on the uh, secondary data only. We also have to collect our own data so that we have data that helping us uh, to to evaluate the important criteria or indicator which is available in the theory of change or in the log frame so that the reporting is pinpoint into the key criteria that the the client organizations or the counterparts and also the donor agency is focusing on and and actually that is very important that's why we have to make sure that we have data enough data and also we have secondary data and also we have the first hand i mean the uh, primary data uh, the third is that um, uh, for many researchers uh, you know um, may see that uh, uh, project evaluations uh, project monitoring is part of the uh, scientific process uh, it is uh, yes but we have to see how we are going to put the uh, research uh, a my into this exercise because it have a lot of factors that we have to consider. There are factors of reaching out to the beneficiaries. There are the factors of uh, reaching out to the key informants. There are the factors of resources that we have for evaluation. There are factors of budget that we have. So uh, although the evaluators should have the research mindset, however, they should be ready also to do the applied research into that. So that is, uh, they will become more a professional practice in project evaluation. Um, uh, number four, um, uh, 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 personally, uh, I see the theory of change as the storylines. And when we have a stories, then there is a pathway to the climax of the story. And that's why at the end of the day, in that storylines that you, you map out and you also present into the evaluation report, they must go into the climax that what is actually the measurement that you have done into the evaluation using that cascading storylines and going to the indicators and criteria and then you have come out with that. So perhaps looking in that way is also helping you to shape how the evaluation result should be reported, not to miss the theory of change, not to miss the a chain of the relations of those activities. So I think this is uh, uh, for uh, practitioners and perspective that I would like to suggest. Uh, we also um, uh, have to make uh, the uh, monitoring evaluation as much as, as practical as we can. Um, perhaps uh, we have to always going back to the project scope all the time. Um, uh, we have to go to the project goals, we have to go, go to the project objectives when we have the big question of whether this is beyond what we have done or whether it is too less or too much. So uh, the, the projects, the TOR and also the project document will be very helping you uh, to be able to uh, make the clear lie whether the project evaluation is within the scope of the projects or the TOR that you have to do. So whenever you have questions, I think the scoping of the project evaluation is helping us a lot uh, to make that, you know, uh, uh, be able to implement. And number three is um, uh, when we do the uh, project evaluations uh, at, at the point that we have to do a survey or we have to do a, a research there, we, we also have to think about the, the research design or the survey design, all right? Because that is uh, very important. However, we also have to think about uh, what is the timeline that we have for that project evaluation or within that particular timeline of the uh, project point that we have to check. We also have to think about the resources that we have. Do we have enough people to do that? Do we have enough tools to do that? Do we have enough uh, time? We have to have uh, money to do that. So although the research decides, the research methodology is, is very good because it is scientific, but also we have to uh, look at the practical point of view of the uh, project evaluations decide as well. And most importantly, um, the third party also have to consider what is the end of the day is the uh, reports or the deliverables that you are commit to, to submit to the donor agency or to submit to the counterpart. That is the, the important one that we have to consider together with the, the research decide. 
And number four, we have to have uh, clear measures that, uh, that uh, we can uh, clearly identify what will be leading to the right tools that we are using for data collections. You know, we may have a very good framework, maybe we may have a very good objectives, but those may, may not be able to help us to identify those into the different criteria. So we need a kind of a, a analysis a little bit to those goals and objectives to make them more clear that we can build the tools to collect data. And last but not the least is the a time frame for reporting uh, in order to set that, you know, maybe the evaluators may not be able to depend on the time of their evaluation projects alone, but maybe we have to build in that time frame of reporting into the counterpart uh, uh, reporting time frame. For instance, whether the counterpart has the monthly reporting to check the progress regularly, so we also have to bridge that into the monthly reporting into the counterpart plan, or is it a quarterly report? So we also have to build the uh, evaluation plan reporting into the counterpart quarterly reports or midterm reviews or the final evaluation report at the end of the year. So we, we have to bridge all of this so that is, is this making everybody happy? And also it's also helping the counterpart to make sense of the results of the evaluations that uh, showing the result comparing to the big pictures of the of the project needs and, 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 and the, the things that they want to achieve. Um, uh, my, my last slide, uh, this is due to the data collection strategies, you know, as I said, uh, and also as Dr. Sylvia has said, um, the project monitoring evaluations, we cannot set the indicators or criteria at the end of the projects or at the end of the phase or at the end of the activities. We have to be clear on the uh, criteria and measures and indicators on day one of the project uh, formulations, project implementation, and that helping the evaluator to be able to make the design of the project evaluation. Although, you know, at some point we have to do midterm review uh, and that the project already moved for the hardware, so we have to go back to the uh, project documents or the uh, project assessment document uh, to see uh, which criteria that we have to uh, take into consideration. Uh, number two that uh, we should not forget, it is a project evaluation, is, is the question is comparison between uh, before and after. All right, so this is the, the thing that we have to keep in mind that we should have a, a base to compare. And then at one point when the project has a progress, so we, have to, we should have the data set to compare before and after so that this will be uh, helping you to make the meaningful a data based on the indicators and measures that you are setting in the world. So number, number three is about uh, using different data source, you know, uh, in order to triangulate the, the result and that can be helping you to do a fact finding from different angles of, of uh, information and also the data collections that helping you to, to be able to see the project achievement from different perspective and also convincing the counterpart and also the donor agency that we already have covering all the possibility of information that we should use for the project analysis, project evaluation. So this is the, the triangulation technique using different data source, different data collection method is uh, very, very crucial. Uh, how far we should go for the very complex statistic analysis? So this is, it depends, but normally, uh, the project evaluation report has to be given to the executives or the donors who may not have, uh, may not be able to understand the technical uh, of the project evaluation analysis. So we have to make it simpler as we can. So when we, when we are going to choose the statistic analysis, so we have to use the one that very simple and also have some coherent with the uh, key measure and the indicators that we are uh, measuring. Uh, it, it always not require always the uh, very complicated or advanced statistic analysis, uh, just simple uh, statistic that we can uh, show the achievement of projects uh, in particular domains of a criteria. I'm saying this, I'm not saying that uh, in all cases we don't need any uh, advanced statistic analytic, but in, in, in some case we may not need to consider that to put into the uh, project methodologies and also the approach for evaluation. 
Uh, number five is when we have the research questions or the project question, uh, the question for the evaluations and also the uh, objective. We have to be able to break down those objectives into the uh, indicators and variables that we can break them down into the, the tool for data collections. And this is very important uh, for us that because in many times that if we don't break down properly, then we spend a lot of time in preparation of the questionnaires. And then when the uh, data come in, we don't use that data because it's, it's, it's too much in detail and it's not even, even meet the objective of the evaluation. All right, so uh, that is a, the, the important, another important part that we have to consider. Uh, we should also have to uh, consider covering all type of source of the data that we can get so that all the data are considered for the analysis. And lastly, we have to also asking uh, ourselves whether we have the baseline to prepare. We have to have a comparison criteria that we, we can compare between the uh, status of the project uh, previously and also the status of the project that we are measuring now. So these are the the some of the uh, practical experience that we would like to share with you and um, uh, thank you very much for 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 this um, it look like we have a question from the audience thanks for uh, extensions for arranging such webinar through zoom and also thanks for a nice presentation how does the project executor or third party monitor the actual feel or physical progress of the project through the pandemic situation so, Dr. Sirius, would you like to address this? Sure, I can uh, share some initial thoughts. Thank you. Um, I think it depends really on several things. And I think some of the key factors are, for example, stage in which this project is already, right? Are we talking about regular monitoring? Has this project just started? Or are we talking about final evaluation, right? So that is one key factor. Another factor, which I think we need to take into account, what kind of project that is, right? Is it purely a development project? I don't know. Uh, on uh, water and sanitation in rural Africa, um, in which case, uh, you know, it might be a little bit more difficult, right, to do things online. Or is it a more kind of research to development projects where you have a lot of research outputs, actually, uh, where you can potentially optimize also some secondary um, data a little bit more, right? So I think it depends um, on some of those things. It depends also on how flexible the donor is, right? What are the donor requirements? How much uh, the timeline for uh, evaluation uh, uh, can be pushed, right? So I think it really depends on some of those key factors. Uh, for example, in uh, some of those research to development projects, I would say it's quite possible, even in development projects, which I mentioned in one of the previous organizations, I think I gave this and I gave that example and, you know, it was not a COVID situation, but uh, the midterm evaluation was actually undertaken, I would say, largely online, largely online due to the costs associated with, uh, you know, flying to different countries. And uh, obviously, I mean, one key thing is also to uh, really, um, uh, I don't want to say use or utilize, but really rely as much as possible on the colleagues, you know, project managers on the ground. Even if it is a development project in rural Africa, let's say rural Niger, uh, I mean, some of the projects I was working on were in West Africa. Um, you know, I mean, there are so many knowledgeable people who've been running those projects and they have vast, uh, uh, you know, contacts, right? All kinds of partners who can also become key informants, right? Uh, even uh, beneficiaries. I mean, it really depends on the situation in the country. Is it a strict lockdown? Are people not allowed to go out from their homes? In that case, uh, maybe... Um, uh, you know, talking to beneficiaries can only be made possible through some personal contacts and using phone or WhatsApp or this kind of tools. But if it is actually possible to go out and talk to the beneficiaries if needed, then probably we just need to uh, bear in mind some extra safety measures, right, as uh, a kind of... Um, 
required by the local authorities, right? So, I mean, all kinds of, you know, sanitizers, masks, etc. So, I would say it really depends on those uh, key factors. One is the stage of the, you know, project. Another one is, you know, this exact situation um, in which uh, the country or the region uh, uh, kind of finds itself. And then, finally just really rely much more unfortunately or fortunately on online tools as well as people working directly on the ground but i would also like to i see my colleague working on uh, also on my project here online uh, brighton who is also an m and &E expert so i don't know if it's possible to just uh, allow him to give some comments for two minutes if that's fine if not uh, i think i have uh, shared just the key uh, Thoughts? Okay, so uh, Dr. Tanatat, uh, what is your view on this in terms of the how we are going to check the situation of the projects on the uh, physical infrastructures there during the COVID-19? Okay, um, let me let me um, elaborate on the situation. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, restricts our movements restrict our uh, ability to gather information and, and get to the primary sources. Not just COVID pandemic, uh, I think there are other situations that may limit your ability to gather data and, and do a proper monitoring and evaluation. Earthquakes, floods, droughts, you name it. Column restrictions. Under that circumstances, um, let me separate my answer into two parts. Number one is your, your project has already started. Your monitoring and evaluation plan and system has been designed, such as in this case. If your project started last year and all of a sudden, the beginning of this year, 2020, COVID-19 pandemic hit. All of a sudden, your country is facing a lockdown. I would, first of all, review the work plan on monitoring evaluation and contact the donors through the Ministry of Finance. That's the channel. And, and trying to work out and propose a way to accommodate monitoring and evaluation, whether it be data gathering, whether it be questionnaires, whether it be using people uh, on the ground, whether it be secondary sources, you come out with that proposal. I can tell you now that, that most, if not all international donors have safeguard precautions, have safeguard measurements to deal with COVID-19 and other limitations. If your second scenario, if your project will be starting after COVID-19 pandemic has hit the country, then you can build in the safeguard. You can design your M&E plan and system accordingly. Making it short, you contact your donors, you work with the donors who also have a, a safeguard measurement in place for, for limitations. So we have another questions, and these questions go to Dr. Tenatat first, and then maybe if Dr. Sylvia has any any opinion on this. So in case the the donor is very much influenced to the project evaluations in order to get the next project. So how the the project owner deal with this this situation? So it's uh, quite a very difficult situation to decide. I'm not sure I can understand. I'm not sure I understand the question clearly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, if if the donor agencies, you know, have a very high influential to the project evaluation, because uh, the donor might get, you know, the advantage of uh, having the next projects in in the field. So how we are going to deal with this situation? Yeah, I think uh, I'm, uh, I'm still hesitant, but I think really even, you know, talking with the donors who are obviously very influential because they are funding the projects, 
I think we always need to bear in mind any kind of safeguarding measures uh, which have been developed and hopefully updated also uh, through the pandemics and any kind of rules uh, and regulations and laws coming out from the authorities. So obviously if there are rules, strict rules on the lockdown and people not being allowed to come out uh, you know, from their homes, uh, and if our evaluation requires really talking to those people, I think, you know, that has to be really negotiated and balanced with the donors, because obviously we cannot do something with, which uh, is going to basically put at risk uh, anyone, right? So I think there has to be some uh, discussion with the, with the donor and kind of explaining the local situation and looking at alternatives and whether it's acceptable to the donor really to do evaluation, maybe through different means maybe online um, or I don't know through some telephonic informal interviews or you name it so I think there has to be just some discussion room for negotiation with the donor thank you very much dr. Tanatat your opinion please your advice the the question is a reality put it this way let me bl be blunt it can happen where international partners through the team leaders are requiring certain outputs and outcomes of the monitoring and evaluation, hoping it will lead on to additional programs or projects. Based on that, there are two scenarios. One, the original project was delayed and the original outputs and outcomes were not met. You can see clearly through monitoring and evalu evaluation Second scenario is hopefully it will lead on to a second project. How do you account for that in monitoring and evaluation? It, you account for it through outputs and outcome and possibly through theory of change. Whether the desired development objectives and output and outcome met the objectives of the project or not. And you may end up finding that your original project development may be short of, of the actual output and outcome, requiring additional projects. Or on the other hand, you may think it's not requiring additional projects, but that's not your decision. That's not the decision of your project director or your team. It's the, it's the decision of your government. It's a de de decision taken collectively based on the outputs and outcome. Don't put yourself into a position where you have to rely on monitoring and evaluation in order to make a decision whether additional projects are warranted or not. Talk to your policymakers, whatever the ministry or the sectors you're in. Look at your sector development plan of your country look at the budget of your country, look at the long-term plan. I'll give you an example. Thailand has a 20-year national development vision that guides every sector. Most of the countries have that, not just five-year plan, but long-term development plan. But at the project level, it's not your decision. I don't think it's something you have to fear but it's a collective decision taken with, with your government and the international partners. So uh, we have to end the uh, webinar sessions now. So uh, AIT hope that these sessions, you uh -huh. know, thoughts and also oh, yeah. some, ideas, some ideas about uh, how you would uh, make your project evaluations and project monitoring evaluations, you know, um, uh, practical as you can, and also be able to copy the situation, copy the context, and also uh, different challenges that you have. So I think at the end of the day, uh, we also have to play the role of the prof professional uh, third party or evaluators that, you know, uh, based on the uh, fact findings exercise and also based on the data information that we found from the evaluation. So there is a boundary that we have to consider when we are uh, doing this exercise. So. Uh, thank you very much for your participation, and I also would like to thank uh, to the speakers, uh, Dr. Tanatat Puttasuan and also uh, Dr. Sylvia Sabo for joining us today. And we are, are looking forward uh, to receive the feedback from the audience and also, you know, sending you further information uh, for further, you know, uh, activities that we can do online. So I give now the uh, time to our 
uh, coordinator, uh, Ms. Warawan, to uh, close the session. Warawan, please. Thank you, Mr. Warawet. So I uh, do hope that this webinar will be fruitful for uh, the audience. And then uh, on behalf of the AT Extensions, we would like to thank for our three speakers, start from Dr. Thanathat Puttasuwan and Dr. Sylvia and Mr. Warawet. And of course, I would like to thank for the AST extension production team to make this happen. And the most important, I would like to thank for the audience for your sharing experience, your questions. And you can visit our website at worldwideweb.extension.aac.ac.th, our Facebook at AAT Extension Pad, and, and another social media from Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube channel for more information about the webinar and online course from our AT extensions. So once again, thank you and have a nice weekend.